So, Rob, it's been a great year. Um, Dan and you guys have done an amazing job and look forward to celebrating you guys all week. Um, but uh, I'm looking forward to this topic. I know it's been something close to your heart. We haven't done a ton of it this year, but I know you've had a, a lot of interest in it from the beginning, just even though you're pushed to do some academic work in this realm. And I'm literally looking forward to your perspective on, on EOF. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I thought today uh, would just be a good um, uh, overview uh, of early onset scoliosis. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the indications for treatment, um, natural history and uh, different techniques. And I'm gonna try to keep it um, as interesting as possible. <laughs> um, as I know, you know, these, these talks can, can get uh, a little bit uh, tough to stay awake at 6.30. So I'll try to uh, sprinkle in um, a good amount of historical perspective. And I think that's, uh, it's interesting to me to, to learn about where we've been um, and where we're going. And um, so that, that'll hopefully keep people a little bit entertained. So um, overview of the talk will be, uh, we're gonna talk, uh, start with the etiology and natural history of, of early onset talk about uh, casting and, and non-operative management. And um, two of the main um, ways we treat um, or EOS uh, surgically really um, can be separated into growth guidance type uh, procedures. And, and the workhorse now um, in the last, at least in the, in the more recent uh, past has been distraction-based techniques uh, with traditional growing rods and then um, uh, the advancement of uh, magic, uh, magnetic uh, controlled growing rods. So we'll talk about that toward the end. So EOS, it's a complex condition with a wide away array of etiologies, uh, associations, manifestations with the variable natural history. Um, etiology can be broken up into uh, really congenital or structural, which are curves that are uh, due to structural abnormalities such as this um, curve that you see here on the upper left of the images with a, a, a congenital hemivertebra. Um, other issues in the congenital um, uh, category include um, uh, patients that have uh, congenitally fused ribs or post uh, thoracotomy uh, deformities, et cetera. Neuromuscular, um, up here on the top right, you can see a patient with a large neuromuscular uh, scoliosis with the sweeping, uh, classic sweeping C-shaped uh, curve and um, um, increased, uh, significantly increased pelvic obliquity. So th these are um, uh, another category of patients. And these could be uh, uh, patients with low or high tone, uh, CP and muscular dystrophies, et cetera. And then there's a uh, syndromic patients <clears throat> and those include uh, patients with uh, spinal dysraphism, Ehlers-Danlos, Prader-Willi, um, arthrogrypotics, and th this patient here on the right is a is a young uh, lady, a young uh, girl with um, arthrogryposis and a severe scoliotic curvature. And then um, there's also, um, of course, uh, the idiopathic um, groups with no clear causal agent. So uh, the natural history of the disease is most of these early onset uh, cases spon uh, spontaneously resolve, and that's approximately 80% of patients that present uh, for this problem. Uh, spontaneous resolution is more likely in, in kids that uh, present during the first few years of life compared to those with uh, later presentation. But those who do um, advance, um, the progressive curves don't, uh, don't do well without intervention. And by age five, 57% of those uh, patients that are untreated have curves that are greater, 70 de uh, greater than 70 degrees. Um, Large thoracic curves can uh, lead to thoracic insufficiency syndrome, uh, which is characterized by decreased uh, thoracic growth and lung volumes. And uh, it, the scoliosis, as it as it impacts, starts to impact the thoracic cavity, can uh, lead to uh, inhibition of alveolar development and restrictive lung disease. And um, can uh, this can lead to core pulmonale, uh, pulmonary hypertension, respiratory failure, etc. And that all uh, leads to um, early uh, death at an early age. So um, part of the problem with early onset scoliosis uh, in our understanding of the disease was that we lacked a, um, a real uh, 
comprehensive um, classification scheme. And um, in recent uh, years, the Pediatric Spine Foundation has done um, a, an incredible amount of work um, to try to address this um, problem with early onset in terms of how we uh, really stratify patients, how we classify patients. And um, these are some of my uh, mentors through the years that um, are huge contributors um, to the PSSG, obviously uh, Dr. Mundus and Dr. Akbarnia, but um, other mentors of mine and uh, people that have been um, hugely instrumental in, in my um, uh you know, development as a, as a clinician over the years, uh, people from the Philadelphia Shrine, Dr. Uh, Randy Betts and uh, Dr. Amer Sundani, and also uh, Dr. Boachi. So these are just kind of giants in the, in the field of early onset scoliosis that have been uh, hugely impactful uh, in my life. So, but the, the, uh, the, the classification scheme um, really looks at uh, etiology, uh, the major uh, Cobb angle, um, and then uh, the, the sagittal uh, plane, as well as um, looking at a, pro a progression uh, of, the, of the curve over time. Um, so, you know, you, you, I'll just go to the next slide, which is really a, um, uh, a example of how the classification uh, scheme can be implemented. And um, so this is a six-year-old with neuromuscular curve um, over uh, two, uh, two subsequent um, imaging uh, studies. She's gone from 18 degree Cobb angle to 32 degree Cobb angle. Her kyphosis has decreased from seven to two. So she's a neuromuscular curve. So neuromuscular gets an M, okay? So uh, that's an M and then two would be because the curve is 20 to 50 degrees. She has a negative because it's uh, less than 20 degrees of kyphosis and a P1 or progression of 10 to 20 degrees per year. So this is kind of an example and illustrates how it's um, become helpful to uh, for clinicians to be able to discuss um, and talk about these patients. Um, so the goal of treatment really uh, for early onset scoliosis is to minimize the spinal deformity by mac uh, while maximizing the thoracic volume. There's a deep relationship, as I mentioned, uh, between the chest wall, the lungs and the spine. And our goal is really has been really focused on growth-friendly treatments to avoid um, to to improve the ability of the thoracic cage to um, to develop, and a lot of our understanding of how that um, uh, of the importance of the thoracic um, cage development and lung development came from uh, Bob Campbell, recently passed away a few years ago. <clears throat> but he was a real giant uh, in the field as well. And this is, these are some original images from uh, some of his seminal uh, works on, on, this pro on, on this problem. And this graph on the right really illustrates um, uh, quite well how um, alveolar development um, really uh, goes exponentially from, the, from birth up to around the age of eight. Um, and, and before uh, the age of eight or 10, um, uh, that's uh, really not a, <laughs> Not a good time to fuse the to fuse the spine. Um, more more work on this um, topic uh, was uh, was done by by Dr. Lori Carroll, and she um, basically showed that um, as you fuse the thoracic spine, as more as you fuse more segments of the thoracic spine, and you decrease the thoracic height, you have a exponential um, or you have a linear impact on um, on uh, pulmonary function. So these are a couple graphs from her from her paper that show that you know as you start to get up to 80 or 90 or 100 percent of the thoracic uh, spine that's fused, the force vital capacity goes down linearly. Um, so this is a real uh, seminal uh, paper, and so this is just an example of this type of a patient. So this is an 11 year old boy who was, had his thoracic um, spine fused at the age of two. And he had 92% of his um, of his spine fused, and you can see just the se uh, severity of the impact on the thoracic cavity and the lung volumes in particular. And this this guy, this kid, had 33% uh, of predicted um, uh, uh, of his predicted uh, pulmonary function, and he had the uh, thoracic height of a of a five year old child at age 11. Um, I'm going to move on now to talking a little bit about the uh, treatment and we'll start with non-operative management. 
but I told you I was going to kind of go through um, some of the the uh, real um, leaders in, in the field. And this is the first kind of slide that I wanted to talk about a, a person um, that I didn't know much about um, prior to putting together this talk. But um, Dr. Min Mehta was, uh, was a real um, leader and, and a real forward thinker in the field of early onset. And um, she was a woman who was bo born in Persia and emigrated to India early in life. And she actually had um, AIS herself and had a, a fairly severe um, curvature um, throughout her life. But um, against uh, really enormous odds, um, Dr. Mehta became one of only a handful of, uh, of female surgeons in the UK uh, in the late 1950s. And as I mentioned, she, so she later became, um, you know, a, a real expert and a world leader in, in early onset scoliosis. Um, interestingly, when I was at the, the Philadelphia Shrine um, doing my uh, pediatric rotation as a, as a resident, we did a fair amount of uh, meta casting, and I never knew um, that Dr. Meta was a woman. But um, in, that's a, an interesting um, part of her story is that the way that she got her fellowship in, in the UK um, to for for a spine, you know orthopedic uh, spine surgery, a pediatric spine surgery, was that um, the people interviewing her when they invited her, they didn't know that uh, that she was a woman. And when she showed up, um, it was sort of a, a surprise, but um, her credentials uh, spoke for themselves and she was um, given the position. So um, her uh, sort of main, main contribution to the you know understanding of the natural history of early onset was really this paper that she published um, uh, in Calcutta, India, actually, um, where she looked through um, hundreds and hundreds of x-rays of early onset um, scoliosis patients. And she found that there was an association between um, these two radiographic parameters. One was the uh, what she coined as the rib phase, and one was the rib vertebral angle difference. Um, the rib phase is really sort of looking at the convex side of the curve at the apical vertebra and, under, and, and looking at the relationship between the rib head and the vertebral body. And in the phase one ribs, these are not overlapped. And then in phase two, there's overlap of the vertebral body and the, and the apical rib head. And then the rib vertebral angle difference is looking at a, a line drawn perpendicular to the uh, axis of the vertebral body there. And then another line drawn through the rib, uh, neck and head. And looking at this angle here um, uh, on the, on the con, um, uh, excuse me, on the concavity and then comparing it to the other angle of, of the other rib vertebral angle. And if it's greater than 20, it was a indication of a disease progression. So these are two examples of that, um, looking at uh, the, the RVAD um, in a patient that is a non-progressive patient. This, this is an RVAD of, of six degrees and showing that this, this curve um, actually ends up uh, resolving on its own. And then this is an RVAD of 20 and showing that it um, continues to uh, progress and, and develop phase two ribs and um, go on to be a, a worse uh, disease process. And this is showing a rib, uh, phase two ribs. So uh, she really was instrumental in, in, in casting. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but um, bracing is, and casting has been around for, for quite some time. And these are just a couple historical examples of how um, bracing and casting have been implemented in, um, over the years, Hippocrates um, utilized a traction table and um, manipulative, manipulative uh, techniques um, on the spine to, to correct curvatures. And this is an example of a, of a turnbuckle cast um, that was uh, utilized in, uh, in the 1900s, early, you know, throughout the, I believe, um, before the 1950s and into the 50s a little bit. These casts were used by Risser and others to treat scoliosis. But um, really modern um, casting techniques were first um, uh, introduced um, by Dr. Eves Cottrell, who um, you see there on the left, um, him, um, that's him and uh, Dr. Uh, Dubesay uh, showing their uh, spinal instrumentation. But um, those casting techniques were mostly abandoned um, after the advent of, um, of Harrington instrumentation and people started to go more and more towards fusion. But Dr. Uh, Mehta, as I mentioned before, largely uh, deserves credit for reviving um, the technique of uh, derotation casting for early onset. And this is a um, example or sort of a schematic of how 
um, de-rotation uh, casting um, is done for, for EOS patients. And th they're placed on a, on, a, on a specialized casting table, um, intubate, intubated and um, sedated for the procedure. And um, the cast is applied, but really these, these, these large de-rotational forces are, are the key to the, to the technique. And she published uh, her, her results in 2005 um, with 136 patients that had progressive disease. And um, she noted that the ones that, um, excuse me, were referred earlier, um, who were younger and had a phase one ribs and, and the lower cobs really did much better. And so that was sort of her, um, uh, you know, call to, um, to, to have a better uh, screening for, for patients and get them referred to specialized centers at an earlier, um, at an earlier stage in their disease so that they could um, be, uh, have the benefit of casting. And then uh, Jim Sanders uh, was was someone who popularized uh, metacasting uh, in the United States, and um, he re basically um, showed that um, it corroborated her results and um, showed that patients really responded quite well, especially earlier and and um, younger patients and smaller curves um, if you get to them early. And then here's a, a study just while we're on the same topic of casting. Um, uh, from from the uh, PSSG that looked at um, compared uh, casting um, uh, to patients that were treated with early uh, growing rod constructs. And um, they showed that the patients, the younger patients that had growing rod constructs that had a higher complication rate than the casting patients. But of the casted ones, 15 eventually had um, had to undergo an operation. So, um, you know, it didn't, it didn't stop the patients from ending up uh, with, with surgery in a lot of these patients, but um, at the very least, uh, the, the, the thinking was that we could delay um, uh, surgery uh, until the patients are older and avoid um, uh, ongoing, you know, complications from growing rod surgery. Um, so that sort of sums up the non-operative uh, part of the discussion, but we'll, um, I'm going to move toward uh, a little bit of talking about growth guidance, and really that can be uh, separated into the Lukey trolley. Um, uh, sorry, the Lukey trolley uh, technique and uh, and the Shilla. So these are um, so the the first um, topic is going to be is just Lukey trolley. So um, the original this is just a slide on Eduardo Lukey. So he's a surgeon. Uh, a, you know, he's pretty famous in, in our field for, for the uh, Lukey um, construct here, where it was really one of the, one of the pioneers in, 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 the, in the first, um, uh, one of the first surgeons to implement a segmental uh, spinal um, fixation with, uh, with Lukey wires. So, but in terms of talking about early onset and talking about growth guidance and non-fusion uh, surgery, he was also um, one of the, one of the first um, to do to try segmental uh, fixation of the spine and allow for a, a self-growing construct. So without, um, try, he tried to basically use segmental wires to guide growth, um, but ultimately he, he got good early correction. But ultimately, uh, as we know, when you uh, do a segmental fixation and subperiosteal uh, stripping of the spine, et cetera, um, auto fusion is a, is a, is a complication of this type of approach. And, um, you know, the Lukey trolley, even though it had good short-term results was, um, was ultimately abandoned, um, because the long-term uh, outcomes were unacceptable. And a lot of that is like I mentioned, um, you know, uh, un, unanticipated auto fusion of the spine. Uh, and then because of lack of anterior column control, um, crankshaft phenomena was not, um, was not, um, un, uh, common. And um, I will move forward because basically that sort of just sets the stage for the, this, this uh, newer technology, which is really, which is called, which they refer to as a modern Lukey trolley. And this is a system of, uh, it is a segmental uh, fixation of the spine with pedicle screws, but these pedicle screws are, are these highly engineered uh, screws with, um, with these peak um, bands that are um, going, uh, that are attached to these uh, high, extra high polished uh, rods, which allow for um, growth, uh, for, for growth as the rods um, slide. So it's kind of a, a newer uh, version of the Lukey trolley. 
And there's some data out there to support its use, but very, very limited. I mean, the only studies that I saw were uh, just very few patients. And uh, again, with any surgical management of early onset, there's high complication rates. In particular, um, the modern Lukey trolley had patients that outgrew their rods um, that required um, reoperations and um, other implant related failures uh, were, were noted as well. And so there's pretty much limited uh, clinical data right now and the, the role um, is uh, yet to be determined. The Shilla technique um, is also another uh, growth, growth guidance um, type, uh, type technique. And it was developed by um, Dr. Rick McCarthy out of Arkansas. And it's called, I never knew why it was called the Shilla. I just assumed that it was named after someone or something, but actually um, the Shilla technique is named after the, uh, the Shilla Hotel in, uh, in Seoul, um, South Korea, where Dr. McCarthy was staying. Um, and he was said to have um, uh, come up with the idea for the Shilla uh, growth guidance um, treatment uh, on the back of a napkin uh, in the hotel. This is Dr. McCarthy uh, with Dr. Barwachi when he was, when Dr. McCarthy was uh, being named a president of the SRS. And I imagine this is what the uh, back of the napkin may have looked like um, with the schematic here showing that um, it was a, a apical fusion. Uh, so getting that initial large initial correction of the apex of the curvature and then utilizing percutaneous uh, instrumentation um, at, at the caudal and cephalad um, aspects of the of the curve, and it's just showing an example of what the uh, what those screws looked like at the caudal, or sorry, across the entire construct, uh, allowing for uh, guidance and sliding of the screws um, through the system. So, uh, Dr. McCarthy published his results um, in JBGS in 2015, showed 69 degree pre-op curve, 40 to approximately. 38 degrees at final follow-up. Uh, complications were high as they are in this patient population. Um, and then several other papers also reported varying success rates with the technique and some suggested that um, the Shilla system was actually, uh, did even despite the high complication rate, required fewer trips to the OR compared to traditional growing rods, um, which was important because that's what we were really trying to figure out how to avoid multiple lengthenings, et cetera. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But other people um, more recently um, have not really uh, been able to replicate Dr. McCarthy's uh, results, unfortunately. So there was some, uh, I guess there's there was some sort of uh, hesitancy in the community um, about the Shilla technique. Um, a, lot of, a lot of surgeons felt that they weren't getting um, as good of results as, as Dr. McCarthy. And this was actually a um, paper that was recently uh, published uh, from the PSSG. And they looked at really a, as many patients as they could outside of Dr. McCarthy's institution. And, it, and they just didn't have the same results. They only had 36% of predicted growth um, of, these, of these patients' uh, spines and then um, high revision rates and high uh, implant related complications. And so this sort of just called into question whether or not those uh, results could be replicated um, across um, across um, other uh, surgeons and institutions. Um, so this sort of uh, opens up towards the um, latter half of the uh, uh, talk and um, we'll start with a discussion of distraction based techniques and the historical uh, foundation for traditional growing rods. And it really did start with, um, with Dr. Uh, Paul Harrington. Um, I, I never really knew this, uh, this part of it either, but, but Harrington rods started as, uh, as an, un, uh, non-fusion, um, device. And so, um, he did a, a, a lot of, uh, animal uh, preclinical, uh, trials and, and studies. And he noted that, uh, the induced scoliotic curvatures uh, of these animal models could, could um, actually return to normal after the deformity was released. And, and they looked at the histology of the growth plates and it also confirmed that the histology could change back to normal. And that really led Dr. Harrington to think that 
um, we could just place instrumentation in the spine and really, if, if an induced scoliotic deformity could return to normal and the histology could return, return to normal, then the, under, then the thought was that these scoliotic curvatures could be returned to normal without, um, without use, utilizing uh, spinal fusion. So that led to the development of the first uh, real iteration of the distraction-based you know, uh, growth modulation um, for, uh, for scoliosis. And, uh, you know, initially he had good, good results in the first six months to a year of, uh, of his implantation of this uh, Harrington rod for, um, uh, for scoliosis. And, um, but then after about six months or a year, these, these constructs really started to break down. And he noted that, you know, correcting a, a, a native a scoliosis in a, in a child is not the same as uh, correcting an induced scoliotic deformity. Uh, in an animal model. And the failures led um, Harrington and others really to abandon um, the concept of dynamic control and dynamic con correction altogether. And um, that's when they realized that the spine really needed to be fused in order to maintain the corrective forces of the implant. But distraction-based um, techniques continued um, for, er you know, particularly for early onset, because even before um, all of this work with looking at alveolar development and thoracic um, cage development, there was an inherent, inherent understanding that um, that we needed to maintain growth until um, as, as long as possible in order to um, avoid complications uh, and early death. And so throughout the 70s and early 80s, um, Marchetti and Faldini added uh, limited fusion uh, to, to the to the um, sort of the traditional Harrington uh, rod with uh, seri serial lengthenings, et cetera. And then uh, Dr. John Moe in the early 1980s uh, modified Harrington's approach with uh, the addition of a Milwaukee brace. And the rod was actually modified a little bit as well. And it was, called, it was referred as the Moe rod. Um, here's like a really cool old timey picture of Dr. Moe. Um, I just thought he looked really cool. Um, and so, uh, but this is um, one of his um, uh, seminal papers uh, looking at Harrington, uh, at his modified Harrington instrumentation without fusion for early onset. And he, you know, noted that, in, you know, he had 20 patients and he, he lengthened the rods uh, every four to six months, take the kids back to the OR. And he ended up, uh, you know, the conclusions were that the method really did allow for uh, continued growth and avoiding early fusion and maintaining the curve correction. So, he started to have good uh, a good indication that growing rod uh, sort of uh, serial lengthenings with the growing rod uh, construct could be beneficial for this patient population. But um, you know, as time went on, uh, very high complication rates were noted by by several different authors, and as we know, the complications are a big problem in this population. So, it really um, was difficult um, to kind of maintain that the momentum and. Uh, particularly a paper by Dr. Uh, Stu Weinstein called into question um, that the amount of growth achieved um, was sort of not, uh, in his study, was, was not as, uh, as um, you know, desire, I guess uh, it just didn't get the same results as uh, others and, and that the amount of growth achieved um, and with the number of procedures that required to get the results was undesirable. And so um, I think that things kind of just uh, slowed down a little bit with the, the um, uh, with the growing rod treatment uh, until um, sort of the modern era of, of traditional growing rods. And I'll kind of talk about um, like the early 2000s, uh, uh, how um, dual uh, traditional dual growing rods really kind of changed the game. And um, I'll, I wanted to introduce just another player that we all kind of know very well, but um, just talk a little bit about Dr. A, because um, from here on out, in terms of the history uh, and, and development of, of treatment for early onset, he's really been um, at the forefront the entire time uh, in the last 20 years uh, in particular. So he was um, trained by Dr. Mo, um, which, you, which you see here on the bottom right, and Dr. Mo and Winter, uh, among others, uh, on the top right. But he emigrated uh, to the U.S. Uh, from Iran around the time of the uh, Iranian Revolution, and as I mentioned, he trained with uh, pioneers in the in the field of scoliosis. This is um, uh, Dr. Howard Steele, 
um, and, and just huge uh, names in, in the field. Um, and he became one of the world's leading experts in pediatric spine and uh, early onset um, in particular. And he was integral in the development of, uh, of you know, traditional growing rod techniques and, and uh, of course, uh, um, ma magnetically controlled growing rods. And, um, you know, so he, he really um, came from a strong lineage of, of, of people that made huge impacts uh, on our field. We know him as um, as Dr. A. You know, he, he's really um, uh, one of one of the best uh, mentors and um, teachers that anybody could have asked for. So, um, I will start with uh, from an academic perspective his impact on the field. Um, I think uh, you can look back at the seminal paper in 2005, where Dr. Akbarnia and Dr. Marx, uh, as well as Dr. Boachi and others, really sort of changed the game in terms of understanding how uh, traditional growing rods can be implemented uh, and impact the, this patient population. The technique was revised, uh, the implants were revised and sort of made a little bit uh, more high tech and easier to, to, uh, to uh, expand. And uh, they suggested that we, sh we should be using two rods instead of one. And they had 23 patients in this initial paper and their cob angles were 82 degrees initial and 36 at final follow-up. T1 to S1 length increased and, um, and their complication rates was rel were relatively low compared to other uh, prior uh, um, uh, uh, studies which had shown complication rates up into the 70s and uh, still had a, an, an unplanned return to OR rate of 17%. Um, and some of these complications, as I mentioned, you know, th these are a major part of, um, of dealing with early onset scoliosis and growing rod surgery in particular. And these are just, this is just a schematic from their paper, which showed the breakdown of their complications. And um, looking at uh, this uh, Venn diagram and about um, five had junctional or, or alignment related issues, five had implant related issues, which included rod breakage and screws dislodging, et cetera, and then three wound related complications. So it's not a benign procedure, but this is um, showing that it did still uh, provide for very good growth of the spine over time. This is another paper that was uh, um, by the Growing Spine Study Group and Dr. A and others that looked at mid to long-term follow-up in 13 of those patients, and again, showed good uh, results. and. Um, they showed in this paper that patients that had more frequent lengthenings at six or less months intervals um, had higher annual growth rates and higher uh, curve correction. This is a paper uh, by Dr. Shea Bess um, and others who um, reported on the in, in, uh, incidence of uh, complications for growing rod treatment. And they showed that, you know, they looked at 140 patients and they showed that um, there was a the, the risk of complication during treatment period decreased by 13% uh, for each year of increased age at initial surgery. So as I mentioned before with casting and the ability of metacasting to um, delay uh, surgical uh, implantation of, of a growing rod, this was, um, this was actually kind of corroborating that concept and saying, look, we can, if we can delay the start of treatment with growing rod, um, we can decrease some complication. And then really uh, importantly, one of the main take home messages from this study was that for each additional surgical procedure that was performed, 24% um, uh, increased risk of complication. So even though we know that taking patients back for multiple lengthenings improves, uh, you know, their, their spinal growth over time, really the, the ultimate uh, issue is that for each time you take someone back to the OR, their complication risk uh, profile increases greatly. Um, they also noted that other things that decreased risk uh, included um, using submuscular uh, rods um, and then uh, limiting the, the number of lengthenings can, can also reduce it. So this really all led um, us to uh, the field to try to uh, figure out a way to lengthen the spine to continue to allow for, for spinal growth while correcting uh, the scoliosis over time. And um, the concept of, uh, of using some type of mag magnetically controlled rod was floating around um, in, the early, in the late 1990s um, and early 2000s. And this was really the first paper to look at a prototypical magnetically controlled growing rod 
and it was implanted. Uh, this is by Dr. Takaso in Japan. And it was this device that was that had this magnetic rod control uh, connected by a wire to a large receiver. And they implanted these rods into uh, a, a canine um, model, uh, uh, beagles actually. And this is showing the, the, the rod uh, uh, across an induced uh, scoliosis in the canine model. And this, uh, this receiver was actually implanted in the abdomen. And then this was the, the remote controller. So the remote controller would go to the receiver and then the power would go and expand the rod. Um, I thought this was really cool. Um, you know, but obviously this is not an ideal uh, device uh, given the huge um, battery uh, pack that has to be, um, you know, implanted in the abdomen. But um, certainly uh, this is the type of really um, advanced, advanced preclinical work that went into uh, the development of, uh, of magnetically controlled growing rods. Um, Dr. Akbarnia um, and others as well were involved in uh, preclinical trials. Um, this is an example of one of such studies that Dr. A and Dr. Mundus uh, did uh, in a, in a uh, porcine model. Uh, and basically they showed that safety and efficacy of uh, a more um, uh, sleeker uh, implant than what was uh, shown on the last slide. But uh, this was the preclinical uh, foundation for um, for magnetically controlled growing rods, and then um, in 2009, uh, this is a picture of uh, uh, of the of the team. I guess <laughs> thank you to Dr. A for providing me with this picture. But this is the team um, that implanted the first uh, magnetically controlled growing rod. This is Dr. A um, with a really cool uh, you know look, and Dr. Uh, Kenneth Chung. Um, both kind of like, yeah, we're bosses. Um, but uh, so um, this is a this is a great picture, I thought. But um, so I'll show you guys what the device looks like for those who haven't um, really uh, seen these rods implanted ever. This is the modern uh, uh, magic rod, um, and then I'll get into. And this is the sort of an earlier uh, uh, device, uh, remote control device. Um, but uh, this is really sort of showing you how this thing works on a very very um, uh, rudimentary basis. So the magnet is down on this part of the uh, of the implant, and as this magnet rotates with the remote control uh, device, um, it basically uh, this this lead screw spins up, and then the rod advances. And so with each rotation, you can get about 0.3 millimeters of distraction. And then in the newer uh, remote controls, you have these uh, panels that provide distraction readings and and things like that. So as the through the early like 2010s, the, the clinical results of, of the magnetically controlled growing rods are really coming out um, in mass. And these are some papers uh, by Dr. Chung and Dr. A and others who, um, which really showed that the, the safety and efficacy of magnetically controlled growing rods showed that it was able to um, correct spinal curvatures in early onset patients. Um, uh, allow for limited uh, uh, surgical intervention. And all of these uh, lengthenings were able to be done in the office instead of having to take the patients back um, for traditional growing rod lengthenings in the OR. So this was really the turning point uh, in our uh, ability to treat these, uh, these patients. Um, uh, later, people uh, looked at um, a co comparison of traditional growing rods. Um, the, there's been just a myriad of studies looking at, at these, this type of question, looking at, you know, are we doing better with magnetic rods versus traditional growing rods? And, you know, the, this paper uh, showed, you know, similar corrections, similar spinal growth, similar complication rates, but just really fewer trips to the, to the operating room um, because each time you want to lengthen, you're, you're doing it in the office. And then uh, this is a, a meta-analysis of um, comparing magnetically controlled growing rods with other distraction-based uh, technologies. And um, really, it you know, looked at 18 studies. Uh, they showed magnetically controlled growing rods were as clinically effective as other distraction-based technologies, significantly lower complication rates. Um, and then looking at health-related quality of life measures with the EOS Q24 question, uh, questionnaire, they showed that MCGR was better, uh, that group fared better uh, in, in HR uh, QOL measures. Um, there is a um, increased levels of, 
uh, titanium are noted um, heavy in metal uh, uh, levels in, in the blood of patients with magnetically controlled growing rods as compared with TGR. But um, the clinical implication of uh, these uh, these titanium levels in the, in the bloodstream are not is not very well understood at this point, and um, there's been several studies looking at cost uh, efficacy of magnetically controlled growing rods. As as many of you know, these rods can be extremely expensive, and um, compared to uh, traditional growing rods, which are relatively cheap. However, um, you know a, as you take the patient back to the OR multiple, multiple times, um, you're increasing the complication rates and you're adding cost to the overall treatment. So with magnetic rods, there's a much higher upfront cost, but uh, many, uh, but some studies and uh, have shown, and this is a meta-analysis looking at, the, at this uh, question, and it shows that overall magnetically controlled growing rods become cost neutral by about four years. Um, uh, and I say, and, and again, that's because of the upfront cost, um, but the lower cost of ultimately uh, multiple trips to the OR over time. So some of the potential um, shortcomings of, of magnetically controlled growing rods are, are failure of distraction, uh, fatigue failure of the implant. These are sort of things that can occur in uh, MPJK. These are all things that can occur in traditional growing rod surgery or magnetically controlled growing rod surgery, either one. But um, loss of sagittal balance uh, due to the long uh, non-contourable uh, actuator. I'm going to just circle back to the picture of the actuator and show that, um, and maybe this picture too, you can see that basically the actuator is this long uh, straight part of the device that can't be um, contoured. So if you look on the left, you have um, a large uh, area uh, of the actual implant that's unable to be contoured at all. So it adds um, quite a bit of uh, difficulty when you talk about being able to um, adequately contour the sagittal uh, profile of these patients. And there's some question about whether, you know, this is something that um, is acceptable in the long term. And ongoing studies are looking at that at the sagittal plane in particular. Um, ultimately, it would be really nice to be able to have an implant that would be able to have some contour. Uh, or have the ability to have uh, some contour and, and you can place it in various locations on the spine. Right now, the only place that you're really able to, pla to, uh, to place this, uh, this actuator is across the thoracolumbar junction where you have a relatively neutral area of the spine. So um, despite the low, um, lower complication rate, there still is a higher uh, complication rate with in terms of unplanned return to the OR roughly 37%. So um, there's people that call into question uh, magnetically controlled growing rods given the high um, unplanned return to the OR rate, but the even with the unplanned return to OR for uh, for magnetically controlled rods, you still overall in these patients have have many have much fewer uh, trips to the operating room overall when compared when compared to traditional growing rods, if that um, if that makes any uh, sense. So, um, you know, this is Bill Lumberg. You know, he's saying if you could go ahead and get me some more MCGR data, that'd be great. So I think you know we still have to um, we still have a lot of work to do, and that's part of what we what we've been doing this year uh, with myself, Dr. A. Dr. Elsa Bay, Fernando, and the students, um, uh, Bailey and William, they've been uh, doing quite a lot of work uh, with us and we'll talk about that um, this weekend at the, at the um, San Diego Spine Foundation Research um, uh, Day. But, um, you know, that's what this is really all about is trying to understand how um, the, the complications uh, affect these patients overall and how we can reduce complications going forward in this uh, with utilizing this technology. So uh, in summary, the uh, curve uh, progression in early onset scoliosis can be life-threatening. We talked about the uh, that early fusion leads to a short trunk and chest underdevelopment. And that's due to, again, like I, I said, the alveolar development um, between, you know, before the age of eight or 10. And um, traditional growth-friendly procedures are promising, but have uh, significant complications. And um, we saw that Dr. Dr. Bess's paper that showed 24% uh, increase with uh, with each additional trip to the operating room. 
So these multiple surgeries have higher risks of complications. Um, improved uh, pulmonary function and quality of life should really be the primary goal. And magnetically controlled growing rods um, have helped significantly to reduce the number of, uh, of, of uh, planned surgeries, uh, as I mentioned, and complications relative to those multiple trips to the operating room, but unplanned surgeries continue to uh, be a challenge. But uh, so we still do have some more work to do. I really would like to thank everybody um, in, in, in uh, the San Diego Spine Foundation for an incredible year. Um, all my mentors, uh, all the attendings and faculty, Dan, my co-fellow, and I'd also like to thank the team uh, helping me to work on the MCGR project all year long, as I mentioned, um, the, the people uh, previously, but we, we really have had a great um, year working on, on, the, on this uh, topic. And so I'd like to thank them as well. And thank you, Dr. A, for uh, your inspiration and your help putting together this talk. And I'd be happy to take any questions. That was a great, that was a great overview, uh, Rob. Um, phen phenomenal job. Um, and I loved a lot of the history nuggets you put in there. Um, this is still a field where the history really matters um, and understanding um, where those before us were um, most certainly determines um, how well you can treat our kids presently. Um, and I see that over and over again, especially when I travel internationally, um, where you see mistakes repeated that our forefathers made. Um, if we could just take a little bit more time and learn from them, I think we'd, uh, we'd do, be, be, be the better for it. Um, you know, if you have a kid that comes in at the age of four with a 60 degree curve, you know, what do you, what are, that's progressing. How about that? Uh, that's progressing. Um, an idiopath. What, what are you going to do? What's your, what's your thought process at that point? Well, I think that, um, the age of four is really, um, it, it's hard to know exactly because there's a lot of family dynamics at play that come into the decision making and everything and how you, you know, is it a patient that is, is, you know, lives close by and can come for different treatments or are they, you know, living in a, in a foreign country or, or far away. But I think that, um, you know, age of four is probably, young enough or, or old enough, I should say, to undergo a, a, a growing rod type construct, either a magnetically controlled rod or a traditional rod, depending on your access to the technology. Um, and then, you know, the goal would be to get the patient to uh, have, you know, if not to skeletal maturity, to get them old enough to where they can undergo a fusion without a a significant impact on their thoracic uh, height and their um, uh, pulmonary function. So I don't think that fusing, you know, obviously fusing a patient at the age of four is not going to, is not going to be, um, is not going to be viable option, you know, and I think uh, casting um, is also as, as the patients get older and older, casting and bracing becomes really almost impossible. So I don't know what your thoughts are about casting a four-year-old, but um, most of the casting that I've uh, witnessed in, in my training and what I've read is more infantile. And uh, when you get to age three, four, or five, uh, it's not to tolerate it. And so um, I think that patient, 60 degrees, is a, it's clearly a progressive curve. It needs to be treated and probably a good uh, patient for a, a growing distraction-based uh, system. That's why I mentioned it because like it, it's, it's like it, it's still, it's one of those pockets that are, that are difficult to figure out what we're going to do. I think the pendulum has swung towards bracing and, and casting. Um, I think that's probably where the pendulum's at um, a little bit more now. Um, not to say that that's the right answer, but I think uh, we're realizing that if you're four and you need six to eight years of growth, you know, there, our instrumentation may not be able to provide that, you know, with, without seeing a substantial decline in ability to help these kids grow or, um, you know, really stiffening up the spine from having a, a solid rod across those mobile segments for all those mm -hmm. years. So 
I know. Uh, it, it's very patient dependent, as you said. It's just it, that's always a good vignette because it kind of shows you because it kind of makes you commit one way or the other on casting versus uh, versus um, bringing yeah. in some um, growth guidance um, or distraction based uh, implants. So I, I would probably be on the side of casting or bracing um, and seeing if it stays. I, I don't mind if that curve gets to seventy. I don't want it to get to ninety, um, but. Um, if, if I can push it off one more year to their five or five and a half, then I'll do whatever I can to push it off just, right. just a little bit longer, you know, but uh, it comes out, like you said, it's a lot of things, patient compliance, you know, family compliance, where do they live? Are they traveling? You know, do they have access to care? Are they able to come back for serial casting, which is a every three month ordeal and is a pain and then just right. a major pain, you know, bracing, as you said, just doesn't work in those kids. They find their way out of it too fast. So. Mm-hmm. it's a tough group so it's either ca- it's kind of more or less either cast or or growing rods so but cool dr a what kind of thoughts do you have that was the calculated question that uh, greg asked because it's, it's <laughs> that makes you think of it's kind of borderline <clears throat> but um yeah i agree uh, um, uh rob you did a great job in putting things together because it's it, it's so it can go on and on for for hours um but i think the you know the, the important thing is that for past few decades is you know early on since scoliosis has been a stepchild of of uh, spinal deformity and scoliosis research society was based on uh ais and uh, and then adult um but i think the, the, the technology has improved, you know, some of the ways that we, we can deal with, uh, with these kids, but, um, but it's, it's not uh, uh, all of that. And, uh, and I think, you know, the future lies in finding uh, the etiology and because there's so much variation in the etiology, it's hard to deal with each specific uh, disease and finding each of them and treating them, I think, um, and preventing them probably will prevent uh, these, uh, otherwise these unplanned surgeries is gonna continue and it's based on the etiology, it's not based on uh, on the, the treatment. Uh, the casting is 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 great, as you, you mentioned, and but the issue is, you know, young children going, taking them to the OR and having anesthesia that re- really, Puts some uh, sequela in in their uh, brain development, and uh, that's why we sort of trying to get some uh, uh, you know trend towards doing it without anesthesia. And and I think we did a couple of them, you know, with Greg in in Mexico that uh, worked you know pretty good. So if we can do that and sort of delay the surgery a little bit, definitely will. Uh, will help the children so but the, you, so are, as you as you um mentioned uh, doing it without without um anesthesia with you you said uh, the other day that it's ipad anesthesia yeah so i have some i have some uh, as i have young children i could recommend some shows that are very very captivating that uh, <laughs> my kids can uh, blame never, it on your kids rob never, blame it never on be your kids. uh <laughs> never be uh, extracted from <laughs> that might work <laughs> I know there's no way we can, you know, even talk to my, you know, grandchilds with, with when they are in the iPads. So. Oh yeah, you got to write down what shows those are so you can use them in the OR. Exactly. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you everybody. Great job, Rob. Appreciate all the work you put into that. Um, I'll definitely be using that talk in the future. <laughs> it's mine. <laughs> it's very, it's, yeah. I'll give you credit, Rob. I'll give you credit. <laughs>